Well, let's let's pray. Heavenly Father, that is our prayer this evening, that you may speak your truth into our lives. Father, we pray that you may just give a hunger for your word, and we pray that through the Holy Spirit, our teacher, Lord, you may apply your word to our hearts this evening. And we ask it for your glory's sake. Amen. Well, three Sunday evenings ago, we looked at two of the four characters in this short letter of less than 250 words in the original Greek, written towards the close of the first century. And the Apostle John was writing to a church leader, Gaius, whom we described last time as the unsettled saint in need of settling. And John may have had the authority of an apostle, but he also had the heart of a pastor. And in this letter, he seeks to pastor Gaius. Now, we know that John is a true pastor on account of what he writes in verse 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. That's the test of whether a man has a, a pastoral heart or not. He delights to see those he has spiritual oversight over keeping faithful to the gospel. John then is a pastor writing to Gaius, the pastored. Um, last time we learned three things about Gaius. Firstly, he is agapetos. That's the Greek word beloved, beloved in the ESV version. John actually only refers to Gaius once by his name. On four other occasions in the 15 verses of the letter, he calls him simply beloved, beloved. So he was beloved. But secondly, Gaius was, we saw last time, he was balanced. He is walking in the truth, but he's also walking in love. His life is a, is a healthy balance of truth and love. And he exhibits his love by showing hospitality to itinerant preachers of the gospel. But lastly, Gaius is beleaguered. There's a, a toxic church leader, most probably in a neighboring church, whose forceful personality John is fearful that Gaius might fall under. So John is also writing to warn Gaius about the toxicity of this man, Diotrephes, but also to commend to him another man, Demetrius, who was quite possibly the, the bearer of the letter. This is the title then I've given to tonight's message. Two contrasting Christian leaders, Diotrephes and Demetrius. 3 John verses 9 to 12. I'd like us to spend a few moments this evening looking at why Diotrephes was unqualified for church leadership and why Demetrius was commended by the apostle. Now, very sadly, there have been some high profile examples of abusive spiritual leadership within evangelical churches within the last few years. Some notable men whose ministries have been widely respected have been exposed as bullies and have been guilty of spiritual abuse. The case of Diotrephes indicates, however, that this is not a new phenomenon. Spiritual abuse was present in the era of the New Testament and was an issue before the apostolic age ended. Well, let's look firstly at this man, Diotrephes, to establish why he was unqualified to be a Christian leader. And he has the rather dubious distinction of John recording five of his character flaws in the space of just two verses. So we have five reasons why Diotrephes was unqualified for Christian leadership. Firstly, and primarily, Diotrephes suffered from self-love. But Diotrephes, who loves to be first. Now, I'm a, a child of the 1970s, and I used to love the American sitcom, Happy Days. 
And there was a, a character in Happy Days whom all the girls swooned over. The Fonz. The Fonz. And he had the looks, the charisma, and the magnetic personality. And he knew it. And he would go to the mirror, this is where it falls down with me, to comb his hair, <laughs> to look at the reflection, and he would fall in love with what he saw. And his ridiculous self-love and uncontrolled ego, well, it was one of the ongoing gags of the program. His vanity was very amusing as it was so preposterous. But self-love in Christian leadership is no laughing matter. It spells trouble. It always ends in tears. And this was Diotrephes. He loved himself. He loved himself. Now, of course, everybody loves themselves to a certain extent. Otherwise, we wouldn't feed ourselves. We wouldn't keep ourselves warm on a cold winter's day. Or we wouldn't keep ourselves hydrated on a hot summer's day. But Diotrephes' self-love was out of control. It was self-adoration. He worshipped the very ground he walked on. He loved authority for authority's sake. He loved leadership for leadership's sake. He loved to be in charge and rule over people, not to serve them, but to control them. And he was exploiting the gospel and Christian ministry for his own ends. He was exploiting his leader, his position as leader of the church to enhance his own reputation. He was very zealous for the brand Diotrephes. He had to be the standout personality in the church. Others had to dance to his tune and carry out his will. It was his way or the highway. He had to have the first and last word when it came to decisions. If there was credit to be gained, he made sure he got it. If there was blame to be apportioned, he ruthlessly ensured it was assigned to others. At all costs, brand Diotrephes had to be protected. His reputation was everything to him. But Diotrephes' self-love and self-adoration was not without consequences, and it proved disastrous. Firstly, people got hurt. They got trampled over. They were treated unfairly and harshly. And we'll come back to this in verse 10. But secondly, Diotrephes was exalting himself and was a slave to his own ego. And because of this, Christ was not being exalted in the church. The, the New King James Version translates verse 9 as this. But Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence. But there's only one, isn't there? Writes the Apostle Paul to the Colossians, who should have the preeminence. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Paul writes. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. So Diotrephes, by his self-love and self-exaltation, was robbing Christ of his rightful glory. He was usurping the Lord Jesus Christ himself. His self-love was actually the root cause of all his other character flaws. John Stott writes this in his commentary on 3 John. Personal vanity still lies at the root of most dissensions in every local church today. And of course we know that to be so true. Often it's claimed that it's a, a point of principle which is at stake when people fall out with each other at church. But the so-called point of principle is really concealing someone's ambition, someone's determination to get their own way at all costs and not to give way to others. Christian leaders who feed on adulation and authority are embodying the Greek word that we've come across in our studies in 1 Corinthians. There are sarkios, sarkios of the flesh, fleshly, living lives where their unrestrained sinful nature is running wild and is causing havoc. This self-love manifested itself secondly in his self-sufficiency. 
But Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us, will not welcome us. Under his leadership, Diotrephes had a, had a strong sense of his own sufficiency. He felt he had all the attributes to lead the church. He had the force of personality and the, the leadership skills to lead the church effectively without any help from outside. He didn't even need the counsel and wisdom an apostle could bring to the table. So he cold-shouldered John and would not allow him to speak in the church. Now, some commentators point to this being a very real problem towards the end of the first century. All the apostles, as we, far as we know, by this time had died, save for John. So some local church leaders were flexing their muscles. They were asserting their independence. They were stressing their autonomy. They didn't want to listen to an old man like John, despite the fact that he'd been a close personal companion of the Lord Jesus himself. No, they would do it their way. But this was dangerous. The church writes Paul to the Ephesians, was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Diotrephes had no authority to disregard John. The apostolic age had not yet quite come to an end and neither had apostolic authority. In fact, it still hasn't. Today's church lives by the rule of scripture. And who were the authors of the New Testament? Well, the apostles or their close associates. So to deny the authority of the New Testament is to deny the authority of the apostles upon whom the foundations of the church are built. But Diotrephes was having none of this. He was self-sufficient. He was accountable to no man, not even to an apostle of Jesus Christ. Self-love, self-sufficiency, and thirdly, Diotrephes was committing slander. So when I come, I will call to attention what he's doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. You see, slander was the cover Diotrephes used to hide his self-love. Smearing John was the weapon Diotrephes utilized to protect his own position of preeminence in the church he led. He maligned John's character in an attempt to destroy John's reputation in the eyes of those he was leading. He made unfounded charges against the apostle. But Diotrephes was not careless, was not guilty of carelessness. It was not a question of him not first checking his facts in the accusations he made against John. No, his allegations were nonsense, wicked nonsense. His sin was far more serious than just mere carelessness. He was guilty of maliciousness. He used malicious words to trash John. And his wicked tongue was off the leash and was blackening a good man's name. Now, by this time, it's perhaps AD 90, and John had enjoyed a stellar reputation of nearly 60 years in the Christian community. But slanderers are those who, with a few drops of poison, can assassinate in five minutes a character which has taken decades to build. No wonder James writes in his general letter to the churches scattered around the globe, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. And that was Diotrephes' tongue, full of deadly poison. He didn't bother with the facts. The facts about John just got in the way of what he was trying to achieve. He was out to discredit John, so he resorted to the defamation of his name. Self-love, self-sufficiency, slander, and fourthly, Diotrephes exhibited short-sightedness. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses 
to welcome other believers. Diotrephes was not doing the very thing John had commended Gaius for doing. Gaius had been exemplary in giving a warm welcome into his home to those itinerant ministers of the gospel, to those who had gone out, verse 7, for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to those who were fellow workers for the truth, verse 8. But Diotrephes had withheld the offer of hospitality to these missionaries. He'd denied them access to his home. He had denied them access to the church. Diotrephes had given them no opportunity to teach God's words to those under his spiritual care. Diotrephes, you see, was myopic. He couldn't see beyond his own parish. He was short-sighted. He couldn't see beyond his own reputation. He wasn't interested in mission. He was not interested in seeing the kingdom of God grow. He was not interested in seeing his flock prosper spiritually through the ministry of outside Christian teachers. Why would he be? Why would he be? You see, Diotrephes was building for himself an empire. It was all about him. His ministry, his name, his reputation, his status. The only growth in the kingdom of God he was really interested in was the growth which would enhance his own standing. You know, one of the evidences for someone's regeneration is a genuine interest in mission and their practical support of gospel work. If somebody claims to be a born-again believer but has no interest in seeing the word of God grow, well, it calls into question, doesn't it, the validity of their profession of faith. A living faith is not short-sighted, but it's far-sighted, looking for the kingdom of God to grow locally, nationally, and internationally. Self-love self-sufficiency, slander, short-sightedness, and lastly, Diotrephes exhibited a plain old spitefulness. He also stops those who want to do so, that is, offer hospitality, and puts them out of the church. Now, John, in his second letter, has some pretty strong things to say about those who welcome false teachers into their homes and who give them a platform to speak from in church. And he didn't mince his words. He is uncompromising. To John, verse 11, anyone who welcomes them, that's the false teachers, shares in their wicked work, writes John. However, the faithful teachers of the word of God should be sent on their way in a manner that honours God. 3 John verse 6. So according to the Apostle John, there is all the difference in the world in the reception that should be given to the false and to the faithful teacher of the gospel. That Diotrephes had been spitefully excommunicating those in the church who had been welcoming those who had gone out for the sake of the name. He'd struck them off the membership role. He had unceremoniously kicked them out of the church. They'd had the temerity to cross him. These church members had had the audacity to question his authority. They'd had the gall to question his judgment. And before they knew it, they were out on their ears. They were persona non grata. They were no longer welcome in the church that they had been faithful church members of. And it was all down to the vindictiveness of Diotrephes, who so easily took offence. I don't know if you've been following all of the fallout from the reception given at Buckingham Palace on Wednesday by the Queen Consort Camilla. One of the guests had alleged that she was subject to a, a racist interrogation regarding her ethnicity by one of the late Queen's ladies-in-waiting, and she went on to social media to air her grievances. And as a consequence, 
the long-standing lady-in-waiting has resigned from her position. May I say it, that is not the Christian way to resolve matters when offence has been taken. That's the Diotrephes way of settling scores. Instead of discreetly trying to put things right, he publicly named and shamed those he took offence at and humiliated them by ejecting them from the church. He was the spiteful bully whose high-handedness knew no bounds. His self-regard was such he could not be challenged. His self-interest overrode plumed justice and trampled over the rights of others. Diotrephes may have had a, a commanding personality. His very presence in the room may have intimidated others. But these five flaws in his character disqualified him for leadership in the local church. Instead of servant-heartedness, possessing an overwhelming desire to serve the spiritual needs of others, Diotrephes was consumed by self-love, self-sufficiency, slander, short-sightedness, and spitefulness. Now, these three letters of John really need to be read together. They were all written, the scholars believe, within a comparatively short space of time of each other. And they have, don't they, that the common theme of the conscious authority of the author, of the one who could simply begin the letter without the need to introduce himself, or who could simply refer to himself as the elder. And 1 and 2 John are written against the backdrop of false teaching. The letters warn about those who had defected from Christian orthodoxy and who had embraced error, those who had denied the incarnation, those who had committed the heresy of docetism, claiming that Jesus only appeared to be a man when he in fact was really merely a spirit, a phantom, an arapician. Arab but here's the thing about 3 John. At no stage does John accuse Diotrephes of heresy or of being a false teacher? On paper, Diotrephes was sound. Doctrinally, Diotrephes could tick all the right boxes. But sound in doctrine, he was not sound in life. His unsuitability for church leadership was not theological, but moral. Doctrinally, he appeared to be walking in the truth, but morally, he was far from walking in love. Whereas Gaius was a, a balanced believer who walked in the truth and in love, Diotrephes was precariously unbalanced. All the orthodox doctrines came eloquently off his tongue, but he knew little about dying to self and reigning in his self-love. He was intoxicated by his pride and God can do, as we know for ourselves, very little with a proud person except humble them if they truly belong to him. And that humbling of self can be a very painful experience. But as we know from the pages of the New Testament, the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. But in Di Diotrephes' case, it seems that he, he wasn't just guilty of self-love, self-sufficiency, slander, short-sightedness, spitefulness. He was also guilty of being a sham. He was a, a sham believer. He wasn't a true believer. See what John writes in the uh, second part of verse 11. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. And that was Diotrephes. He was habitually evil. He did evil. He hadn't seen God. In other words, he hadn't come to know God through Jesus Christ, his son. He had not seen him with the eye of faith. He had not repented from the heart. And this was the ultimate reason why Di Diotrephes was not qualified to be a Christian leader. He wasn't a Christian. Plain and simple. He was all dressed up as a Christian. 
Theologically, he taught like a Christian. Doctrinally, he professed like a Christian. But morally, he wasn't one. He had not repented of his self-love. He had not repented of his permanent desire to put himself first. He had not died to self, and he had not been raised with Christ to new life. So Diotrephes was a spiritual sham whose pattern of life should not be imitated. But it's a natural thing, isn't it? In the Christian life, to have role models to look up to, that's absolutely no bad thing. It can be very helpful to observe how another Christian, older and more mature in the Christian faith, handles him or herself in life and particularly in trials and, and to learn from such people. So we see lastly, Demetrius, a Christian to imitate. John commends Demetrius to Gaius in verse 12 as one well spoken of by everyone and even by the truth itself. That's quite a commendation, isn't it? Even the truth itself speaks well of Demetrius. What does John mean? Well, I think it means this. There was a transparency to this man's life. The authenticity of his Christian faith did not need the testimony of other people. It didn't need their evidence. It was self-evident. He had their testimony all the same. Everybody had a good word to say about Demetrius, including John. Spend just 10 minutes in this man's company and you would know that he had died to self and had surrendered his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was as plain as the nose on John's face. The Lord Jesus was Demetrius's saviour and Lord. Demetrius was that Greek word, hagios, holy, set apart for God's purposes, a saint not only in status, but also saintly in practice. Whereas Diotrephes robbed Christ of his glory, brought shame on the church and hurt people, Demetrius's life glorified Christ. It commended the church to its community and it proved to be an inspiration to others. He was, in John's words in verse 8, a fellow worker for the truth. Just imagine your gravestone marked F-T-W. Your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren pay their respects and lay some flowers and ask the question, what does F-T-W mean? Oh, is the answer. He or she was a fellow worker for the truth. What an epitaph for us to have. May it be so for, this, so for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.